Ladies and gentlemen, my name's Paul, and in this Red Gaming Tech.com video, we're going to be discussing and analysing tech news, which, as usual, has popped up in the past 24 or so hours. And I hope you're all having an amazing day. We're going to kick this video off with multiple pieces of news concerning AMD's Threadripper 3000 series processors. The first of those pieces of news would be Castle Peak. The codename appears to have been confirmed, not officially, but all but officially, thanks to PCI SIG, who are, of course, the consortium responsible for maintaining the PCI standard. This um, was originally spotted by Momomo on Twitter, and the entry confirms PCIe 4 for the new HEDT platform, which is well, not the most shocking piece of news. I think everyone would riot if uh, Castle Peak slash Threadripper 3000 did not support PCIe 4, but both Rome and Ryzen uh, 3000 did. But right there, in, uh, we can see as the identifier, both Rome and Castle Peak, and the max lane width is time 16. It's basically all what you would uh, expect for this entry. But it is nice that we have the uh, code name all but confirmed. Uh, the code name, at least to my recollection, was first seen in a leaked roadmap slide by uh, El Chupaz Informatico. I believe that's how you pronounce the website name. Uh, I think that was like late last year we saw that slide. But either way, I believe that was the first time we saw Castle Peak. Uh, furthermore, Benchlife has uh, told us that they believe Threadripper is going to launch in November. But they don't have an exact release window. They just think it's going to be at some point in November. But the release of Threadripper 3000 is kind of interesting because... As we saw on the USB IF website, there appears to be multiple chipsets which are related to the uh, Threadripper uh, next generation CPUs. And those have been TRX40, TRX80, and WRX80, although the latter isn't known yet. Maybe that's going to be workstation related, uh, but I've I've uh, kind of gone very deep into that in other videos, so I'm just going to glaze over it really quick in this one. But the reason I'm bringing that up is because TRX40, uh, a couple of weeks ago, was seen on a couple of Asus motherboards, TRX40 uh, motherboards, and that was originally reported by videocards.com. However, uh, now MSI have two motherboards that have been seen on the EEC those, of course, are unannounced, but they have a TRX Pro 10G and also a Pro Wi-Fi model. So those are kind of like the mid-range tier motherboards. And obviously, they also have the higher-end boards as well, such as MPG and the Meg ones. It's going to be really interesting what we finally see in Threadripper and whether we are going to see the CPUs launch in two waves. That was the rumor anyway that we would see the, the lower end if you can consider any version of Threadripper a lower end. And then we would see higher end boards which are going to be more aimed at like professionals and workstation users launch next year. Keeping on the subject, however, of AMD, and there is an article on WCCF Tech, which actually ties in very well with something that the retired engineer on Twitter was discussing, and also uh, a couple of my other sources have mentioned this as well, but full credit to Charlie over at Semi Accurate, who I believe was the first individual who heard of this, who got wind of this, and that is that Milan, which is the next generation of server processors from AMD, uh, so we had Nepal's, we have Rome, and now of course the future processors are going to be known as Milan, it will have up to 15 chiplets on board. Rome has nine. One of those, of course, is the IO die, the other eight are uh, CPU uh, our, our CPU. So you have eight times eight because each of the dies contains eight CPU cores, and that gives you 64 cores total for the processor. And it's really interesting because there have been a lot of rumors concerning the chip chiplet nature for that. Um, and if that's true, 
it would be very interesting to see the configuration uh, of what we're going to be seeing for this particular processor. According to WCCF Tech, they believe, according to their sources, that it's possibly, potentially going to be HBM2 on the actual uh, on the actual CPU. Rome supports up to eight memory channels, DDR4, and obviously there are constraints in memory bandwidth, i.e. the more uh, CPU cores you have, and obviously the faster those cores run at, the more memory bandwidth you require. Now, obviously there are things like efficiency, and you can also increase the speeds that the memory DIMMs run at, but there are limits that you can go to. And we have uh, already already learned that Milan is going to be socket compatible with Nepal's. That was actually confirmed by Forrest Norad. He said that no, uh, Milan will not use DDR5. Uh, but what we probably will see is a shrink to um, in density because it's going to be using 7NM+. So that's at best going to be around 20%, which does give you a little additional space on the... Um, on the CPU to kind of cram in more processors. So it's possible we could see different configurations for this processor um, because we don't obviously know what AMD are planning. I wouldn't be surprised if we see 10 CPU uh, chiplets and then we also have four chiplets for HBM2 and then obviously the final chiplet would be for IO. Uh, but I suspect that this processor, no matter what it is, is going to be absolutely monstrous and it's um, something that I'm really looking forward to seeing what actually Zen 3 is capable of. I'm actually in the process of writing a Zen 3 speculation piece, but because there are a couple of pieces of news which seem to contradict one another, I decided to hold off until now. But now we have this additional confirmation of the 15 chiplet rumor, I may decide to throw it out as kind of an early predictor. Anyway, next piece of news, and this one is NVIDIA. Oh dear. Oh dear. Um, yeah, so this report comes to us via my drivers, and I'd like to thank Tommy for sending me over a link to the article. So, NVIDIA are apparently planning to introduce more supercards as well as a 1650 Ti. The 1650 Ti, the, 1650 the GTX 1650 Ti, just to be very clear, has been rumoured for quite a the number of days now we've heard multiple reports of it but the 1660 super we've not heard anything about until now uh, the 1660 super is apparently going to be using gddr6 but the uh, actual core configuration is basically identical to what we already have as for the 1650 Ti, well, it's going to be a halfway house, as you can probably imagine, between the vanilla 1650 and the uh, 1660 vanilla, uh, which doesn't really give us an exact configuration. It's probably going to be around the 1024-ish CUDA core count, because after all, the 1660 is 1,408 CUDA cores, and the 1650 vanilla has 896 CUDA cores. I have uh, gone into the 1650 Ti previously in more depth as a rumor, but uh, that's why I'm kind of glazing over it in this video, but I do want us all to be on the same page. I think it's kind of funny that we're seeing yet another entry into the Super Series, which is not the RTX 2080 Ti Super, although if that is a real card that ends up getting launched, please don't have that name. It's going to be an absolute nightmare to not only say, but type and just, oh god. Um, but yeah, this is clearly one of those things where NVIDIA are bumping up the lower spec uh, SKUs in its lineup in preparation for AMD and the Nave 14 GPUs. Uh, that could actually be a good indicator that the Nave 14 cards are uh, pretty, pretty impressive in terms of raw performance. Obviously, we don't know yet, but the 5700 and 5700 XT are competing extremely well with the RTX 2060 Super 
and the RTX 2070 Super. So that's definitely very good. And we also have a lot of uh, custom AIB cards from Sapphire, MSI, and other companies as well, which are starting to trick out uh, out onto store shelves and uh, also to AMD's credit they have been doing a lot of optimization on the driver side as well which means that the performance of those cards is definitely starting to improve. The final piece of news for today is the i9-9900KS which as the name implies is an update of sorts to the i9-9900K. This CPU will be available in October, that is the KS, not the K of course, and will still be an 8-core 16-thread processor with one difference, and that is that the boost frequency of the CPU has been uh, increased to 5 GHz. So this is a push for Intel to ramp up the clock speed as high as they reasonably can, I am not actually interested in the CPU necessarily for a few hundred additional megahertz on the uh, default clock. What I am interested in, though, is what it's going to be capable of for overclocking. So I imagine the CPU potentially is going to be uh, very, let's say, very well binned. It's probably going to be basically the winner of the silicon lottery. What hasn't been specified, however, is either the TDP of the CPU or the pricing of the processor. Theoretically, the cost of the processor is going to be more expensive than the i9-9900K, and you can also imagine the TDP is going to be higher as well because well, basically, it's it's a higher clocked i9-9900K. But if it is very well binned, maybe the TDP isn't going to be that much higher. Who knows? Oh, and if you're wondering what the heck the KS means, the K obviously signifies it's unlocked, whereas the S signifies special edition. Um, this is definitely a push for Intel to maintain its position as the best gaming processor available to consumers frankly this is not going to be one of those processors that you're going to jump on if you've already got let's say a 9700k or a 9900k but if gaming is your thing or maybe you just want to collect special edition processors i do actually know one or two people who just pick those up because they just look cool or maybe they don't even use them and they just keep them on their shelves then you know that's going to be kind of cool Personally, I think from Intel's side, the i9-9900K does a pretty good job of holding its own in terms of gaming. Content creation is probably not going to be going so well for the company, particularly when the uh, 3950X launches. But who knows what the heck's going to be this state of affairs when we see Comet Link. Uh, obviously, it's still going to have fewer cores than AMD, but maybe with certain applications, if they can crank the clock frequencies up... Uh, maybe they can hold their own on certain content creation applications. And I suspect in terms of gaming, uh, Intel will remain king in terms of minimum frame rates. But let's be honest, it's not like Ryzen 3000 is a slouch either. But hey, it's just great that we've got some competition in the marketplace. With all of that said, hopefully you've enjoyed today's video. If you did, then you know what to do. You can like, share, comment and subscribe. And I thank you very much for doing so. Take care of yourselves. Bye for now.